Here we go. Okay. Okay, today I have on the podcast Dr. Edward Bassingthwaite, also known as the Healing Vet. He's the creator and teacher of the Whole Energy Body Balance, or WEB, method, which has been used to relieve chronic pain in pets without medication. He joins us all the way from Australia, where he's a holistic veterinarian with over 20 years of experience. His focus is on using natural and conventional methods to treat animals in, in the comfort of their own home. And I'm very excited to get into all things here with, with Dr. Edward. Um, specifically around how you can find hidden pain that your dog can't speak up about. So, Dr. Edward, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So, why don't you fill in anything I may have missed there in the intro, and we'll get right into it. No, I think you covered pretty much all of it, what I do, yeah. Okay. I hit it, hit the, the nail on the head there. So, um First off, you have a, a few pets of your own. Can you introduce uh, one or more of those? I've got Pavati here. She's a bit hard to see because she's black. <laughs> she's a bit upset because I just got her off the bed where she was comfortably asleep. <laughs> so she's yeah, she's, uh, she's pretty camouflaged there. Come here, Mitzi. Here's one of my dogs. This is Mitzi. Hi, Mitzi. And Mitzi is a... He's half silky terrier, half shih tzu, and all attitude. Okay. <laughs> nice and to meet you, buddy. Pearl as well. Come here, Pearl. So Pearl's, Pearl's my old girl. She's a whippet. Hi. She'll probably look a bit put out because she doesn't really like being on camera very much. <laughs> she's, got the, she's got the shy look going. Yeah. Like, well, I don't want to be on camera. All right. Well, thanks for the intro to uh, to to your your additional members of the household there. So, just starting with, what was the the, the journey of you getting into veterinary medicine to begin with? Uh, well, I, I grew up on a, a cattle property, or what you'd call a ranch for you guys in America, <laughs> fairly sizable one in North Queensland. So, I was I started off working with animals from a very early age, um, and in my early sort of days, I was very, very interested. We did all our cattle work on horseback and we bred horses and competed on horses in camp drafting, which is a bit like cutting, but different, sort of a unique Australian horse sport with cattle. Hmm. And um, I really got interested in natural horsemanship, you know, the work of Monty Roberts and stuff like that. And um, then when I went off to university, I, I thought that the veterinary degree would be a good degree to take back to run the family farm with. So that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My, my sister actually lives about a mile from Monty and, and knows the family well and has done a few events and stuff with them right there in the, the Santa Inez Valley. So um, small, small, world. small world. And she's a recent dog owner herself, a little golden retriever puppy. So... She's uh, been a podcast episode, our guest herself. Um, so going into, into traditional veterinary medicine, what, what then was your, your initial experience there or practice and what led you into more holistic approaches? Um, look, initially, you know, I grew up, where I grew up is a pretty conservative sort of area. So I, when I started off in veterinary science, I was very much a conventional vet. Um, a couple of years into my veterinary life I did a locum job a temporary job at a practice where I met a a really good horse vet called Dr Tom Ahern who traveled up to this town from the city to work on some horses and what he did was work on horses necks and he'd get horses that had a fall in lameness that would have been x-rayed and nerve blocked and they couldn't find a reason for it hmm. and he'd work on the horses necks and the lameness would go away so nerve root compression and his He's a very generous man. He gave me a like a master class basically in an afternoon. We sat down for an hour or two and he gave me all this information about how you need to have healthy movement in the spine and if there's restrictions or mm -hmm. constrictions in healthy movement and nerve root compression, it can cause all sorts of health problems. And um, at that point I thought, well, if it works for horses, you know, what about dogs and cats? And it's not something that I'd ever been taught about at university. So I just, there were, and in those days, you know, these days there's all sorts of online trainings where, or 
a big broad range of modalities where you can go and learn how to do hands-on stuff with animals mm -hmm. got um a whole lot of you got pet massage over in the states uh, myotherapy uh, trigger point therapy acupressure bowen emmet and what i teach the whole energy body balance there's a whole lot of things but in those days it just wasn't anything. So I got my, started putting my hands on dogs and exploring with my hands what was going on with their spine and their body in a, in a deeper way than I got taught how to at vet school. Mm -hmm. And I started finding a whole lot of interesting things in that a lot of these dogs had pain and tension in their bodies that wasn't obvious unless you started to really sink in and palpate in a really focused way to find out what was going on. Mm. That's probably my first step into more holistic stuff then i went and worked in the uk and did a lot of temporary jobs for a while and after about a year and a half in the uk i got really unwell myself mm. i i had what i thought was chronic fatigue syndrome at the time so it's probably lyme disease as well now that i look back and having had really good response to lyme herbs i'm assuming that i had lyme as well but um, I was really, really, really unwell, you know. Um, my mum and dad came over to visit me in the UK and they took me home. And I don't know if I would have been able to get home without them. I was so sick. Wow. And I had a couple of years where I couldn't work at all and had Western medicine help me with some of the symptoms initially, some of the problems. And then it's like they, what, they had no more answers. But I was still really unwell, so I started exploring a whole lot of alternative stuff you know, supplements, diet, um, and energy healing and things like that, and found that they made me feel better. Mm. And then I just started sort of naturally integrating that in my practice, and I found that the animals responded really well to it too. So, and my journey has just slowly, I was still working in other people's hospitals at that time. You know, once I recovered enough to go back to work, I was working in conventional hospitals. A lot of them are not very open-minded to alternative stuff. So then about um, 16 or so years ago, I started my first home visit practice and that gave me the opportunity to start to really expand into more alternative things and start to use more homeopathy and, mm -hmm. and back off on the vaccinations and, and just change a lot of what I was doing in a more holistic way. And then about six years ago, I moved from Townsville to northern New South Wales to a little area called the Northern Rivers where it's much more open-minded community um, and a very, very big interest in natural and holistic stuff. So that's where the Healing Vet brand started up and that's where I really started to expand and I started teaching whole energy body balance. And the last two years I've been in Melbourne and just earlier this year I launched the online training for whole energy body balance method as well. And we've got, you know, over 200 people from all over the world now in, in the method learning and, and a couple of practitioners in the UK and several in Australia and lots of practitioners in training. Excellent. And, and for those listening, they can go to web That's W E B B for pets.com, which is where you have that online course you just referred to. Correct. The number four in the middle. The number four in the middle, right? W E B B, the number four, and pets.com. Yeah. Yeah, that's the information page. So you can go there. And you know, the other thing is just look me up on Facebook, the Healing Vet. I've um, got a really active presence on Facebook, and I do a lot of free Facebook live videos and all that sort of thing. And I also, you know, run a free webinar every two weeks talking about the very topic that we're talking about today, which is, I think, the most important thing that I've got to share about animals at all, which is this massive, massive problem of silent, undiagnosed pain in our right. companion. So before we get into that, the, the first thing that came to mind when you talked about working on, on the horse, um, as well as when you then applied that to, to dogs working in the, in, the, in the spinal area was chiropractic. So how, do, how does um, the web energy body balance method or your your methods in particular um, how are they similar and how are they different from traditional chiropractic well they're, they're really not similar to chiropractic at all um, chiropractic generally is completely focused on the spine you know it's very much 
focused on finding subluxations, you know, which is a slight misalignment of the vertebrae, which then can lead to nerve root compressions and pain and dysfunction. And most chiropractic, they use sort of high impact adjustments. So it's a, a rapid, quick force to, and you you know, if you've had people who have been to chiropractor and you get clicked or cracked. Right. Um, and I must admit though, that there is a growing sort of number of chiropractors that don't do that high impact stuff and are very gentle, which probably gets a little bit more towards what I'm doing. But I think the thing with whole energy body balance is that for one thing, we're not just focused on the spine, though the spine is a very important part of what we work with. We're focused on the whole body and particularly focused on working with the fascia, uh, working with what I call the neurofascial network because mm. the, the fascia's got an immense amount of um, sensory and nervous tissue embedded within it. And the fascia is also this amazing, complex, three-dimensional spider web of tissue that interpenetrates every single part of every living being's body. Mm -hmm. So once you start interacting with the fascia, you can, you know, you can be working on one part of the body and you can get sympathetic release of pain and tension in very distant part of the body because of this interrelation and interweaving of all the tissues together. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I've in the past I've done um, a series of se of rolfing sessions, and then now myself I do. I'm very religious about foam rolling, um, you know, which is almost like you know you feel like you're really massaging, but I think more it's kind of you know ironing out the the fascia there. And and t I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but my visual of the fascia is like it's like one giant piece of sheet of saran wrap that kind of encompasses the entire musculature. But I could be wrong about that. How would you describe it? Look, my, the way I describe it is that, that, like, if you have a muscle, yes, there is a thick layer around the outside of that muscle. But then inside the muscle, the muscle breaks down into smaller and smaller sort of blocks of tissue. Each of those layers also has another layer around it until you okay. get right down to the individual cell, which has this microscopic sort of fascia called the extracellular matrix around it as well. So it, it's and all that is connected. It's all connected. And if you look at it microscopically, it's like, it's almost like the arches in a church. You get all these curves mm -hmm. and when you stretch them and move them, they can rearrange and, and, and also everything slides over everything else in healthy fashion. You know, if you get the back of your skin on your hand, you can move, the skin very easily it just flows over the top and with healthy fascial tissue you get that quality of springy healthy movement throughout the body but if you get physical trauma or mental emotional trauma then you can get that locked into this neurofascial system and you get constriction where it can't move so that's where the hands-on work with the fascial tissues and you mentioned rolfing i've had a lot of rolfing and i continue to have a lot of rolf rolfing work i go and see an amazing rolfing practitioner here in melbourne at least once a month mm. and part of the thing with me having chronic fatigue was that i had an immense amount of stiffness and pain and tension in my body as as part of that disease and um being worked on by really high level body workers has taught me a hell of a lot too you know and rolfing has been a big inspiration in terms of me being worked on and me feeling these particular special forms of touch that they use that really interact with the fascia and it's definitely influenced what I do with animals really deeply. Interesting. So that's kind of the, 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 the rolfing or, or, or the looking at it through the lens of the, of the fascia kind of in, encompasses the physical or mechanical side of, 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 of what you do if I have, or some well, part it of it. It does, but then the fascia, um, you know, you have these fascial trains that run through the body. There's a, I can't remember the name, but there's a book, Anatomy Trains. Myers, I think, the guy who was a rolfer who went on to do this research into the fascial structures in the human body. So you have these pathways of fascia that flow through the body, like a deep front line, deep back line. You've got side lines. You've got these other uh, ones that spiral around the body. And all that, our dogs have similar patterns. Hmm. But it's not just physical because they're energetic pathways through the body as well. You know, the, the 
meridians that are used in acupuncture and acupressure follow these fascial trains. Interesting. And they've even started to find that in the acupuncture points, there's these microscopic anatomical structures where the needles are put in. So these are energetic pathways, but they're physical as well. And it's not just physical because in the body you have these special um, nervous receptors called interoceptors, which are to do with the sense of feeling. So whenever your dog has an emotional, mental emotional experience, there's a physical feeling in the body that goes with it. You know, if you see a dog that's like this, you know you've got a sad dog, right? So there's a body posture or shape that goes with feelings and the fascia is really, really intimately involved in, in that way of holding energy in the body. And if you get a dog that's been mistreated and has got post-traumatic stress, then there's a physical patterns of tension in the neurofascial network that are holding that pattern of experience or trauma in the body. And when you release it, then you can get really, really big changes in that dog's behavior. You know, for instance, there's a greyhound I worked on quite a few years ago called Benny, who was an ex-racing dog. Hmm. And he had an extraordinary amount of pain in his body, but he also had a hell of a lot of trauma. He'd had a long racing career, won a lot of money. And the way they train and work and house greyhounds is very traumatic for them. But after four treatments, he changed from a grumpy old dog that didn't want anything to do with anyone hmm. to a dog that started playing with toys for the first time in his life. The dog that was going into the daughter's bedroom and stealing her fluffy toys and cuddling up with them at night. <laughs> a dog who was, instead of just lying on his bed, complaining about everyone watching, watching TV because he wanted to go to sleep, and he literally would grumble at them, <laughs> to actually going around all the family and saying, give me pats, give me pats, you know, seeking touch, seeking attention. And he also became the naughtiest puppy in the world at the age of 12 after these treatments. Wow. He started getting into bins, which he'd never done before. He ate the bottom what? out of a or getting into bins and tearing things up. Oh. <laughs> just behaviours they'd never seen before, which is not just due to relieving the pain, in my opinion. I believe that we're actually relieving trauma by releasing the physical patterns of trauma trapped in the body. You can lead to really releasing the mental and emotional realm as well. Interesting. Yeah, it's all connected together in ways that we might not be able to actually see or you know even under understand but you know someone who's very experienced like it with with yourself obviously is able to observe and you know probably follow your intuition a lot in terms of of what you find and what you see yeah well and, and you know um when i first came across energy healing it was like well this is sort of strange but i can feel stuff going on like i just saw this training which with something I learned years ago called the EMF balancing technique, which I don't practice anymore. But at the time I just had my body said, you need to do this. And what the hell, this strange energy work stuff. I've never come across this before. But when I went and did the training, I could feel it. You know, these people weren't touching me with their hands and I could feel stuff in my body. And after the treatments, I felt better. You know, I had improvement in my symptoms. And the really interesting thing I noticed was that when I went home and practiced working and flowing with the energy, I was living in the, at the family farm in a, a dwelling a little bit separate from the main house, maybe 30, 40 metres away. Every time I sat down to practice, the dog I owned at the time, Tico, who was a little staffy, would come to little up the steps and sit at my feet. Now, huh. the first three or four times, I thought, wow, that's interesting. But after 10 or 20 times, it's like, well, she can feel what I'm doing. And how far away was she at the time, usually? Oh, I don't know. She was just down in the main house hanging out with the other dogs and my mum or something or something. But she just absolutely regularly and repeatedly turned up every time I started practicing with energy healing. Wow. So that led me to think, well, you know, one, she can sense what's going on. And two, she must like it or she wouldn't keep coming back to, to be with me when I'm doing it. Yeah, it reminds me of my interview with Kathleen Prasad um, of animal um, animal Reiki uh, healing. Yeah. And so you know, we had a conversation around that and she just talks about her entire practice of, you know, basically how, how you know, dogs really respond to that. And there's no, there's nothing physically happening. And it's just, the, you know, the, 
the the energetic vibration of being in a calmer whatever state is contagious and uh dogs have a you know seem to be more sensitive to it perhaps than we humans are well absolutely and you know energy healing has got a reputation of being a bit woo woo and airy fairy and and all that but there is actually some pretty good high grade evidence to show that this non physical energy work stuff is doing something physical and creating physical changes and if you look into it there's some reasonably high grade studies that are showing that stuff is going on and i believe that you can explain it in terms of electromagnetic fields and biophotonic emission emissions because you know our electromagnetic field is primarily driven by our heart that's the biggest driver of the electromagnetic field in in our being and it extends way out beyond our body so this coherent electromagnetic field of energy that some people, if they're sensitive and intuitive, can decode and see as auras and things like that, it extends way out. And I believe that you can start to explain that, that empathic sense. You know, Sometimes when I'm working on dogs doing treatments, I'll get very, very strong emotional experiences happening in me that I know are not mine. And often when I'm doing this with the dogs, they'll suddenly get really restless and say, oh, what are you doing? I'm not doing any touch that could be painful either when this happens, right? So what I believe is that they're re-experiencing some old traumatic event and I'm empathically sensing it along with them. And if I can stay with them and get them to stay connected and ride through it, then often this is what I believe is leading to these behavioral changes is that the unsticking and reprocessing this old energy that's stuck in the body system. Wow. Fascinating. So if someone walked into one of your sessions or let's say that they were sitting there when you walked into a room where a dog at home that you were about to treat um, is sitting or running around or whatever they're doing, what would, what would someone observe? Oh, that's a good question. So, so I have a little treatment room here and, you know, the thing is that the other thing about the whole energy body balance work is that there's a lot about communication and dogs are non-verbal communicators. 99.9% .9 of their communication is not got to do with any sort of vocalization or sound, you know? So as soon as a dog comes in, I'm going to start communicating with them with my body language. Um, I'll, I'll start maybe doing slow blink soft eyes might yawn at them because that's a calming signal right interesting so if you yawn at a dog that's anxious it'll it'll help them relax hmm. but the main thing that i really think causes a really profound effect on the dog is my state of consciousness and awareness in my body so the first thing in the foundational skill or practice that I teach in the whole energy body balance method is I teach my students to bring all their awareness into their physical body. And then once that happens and you know, we, we go into some depth about bringing all your sensory awareness and noticing what's going on and just being with what's there without any need to change it or understand it or anything like that. And then being aware of the space under your feet and there's natural energy connection with the earth, which you can call electromagnetic energy or chi if you, you know, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by qigong and that sort of stuff so there's this natural flow of energy from below up through your body you connect with that and then i can see you responding to this now <laughs> <laughs> so i just saw your physiology shift a little and then you can then you become aware of the space above your head and the, at the same time there's this natural energy flow coming down so the energy flow from the earth up through the body is like yin energy feminine energy and the energy from above is young energy or masculine energy. And there's this always, we always have this flow. It's always been there. It can get blocked or not be fully open. And the more awareness you bring to it, the stronger it gets. And then these two flows of energy, if you become aware of your heart center and feel like where they connect, they then expand and flow out through your arms and hands to the dog. Now, when I teach this, you know, I, I do, I teach here in, in my little home about every three months I do live sessions and we have, you know, six people and their dogs come in. At the beginning of the day, all the dogs are like, oh, I'm in a strange place. There's that other dog over there. I don't know that other dog. This is a bit, bit edgy, you know, well, what's going to happen? But when I first do this exercise, 
you know, I'm talking to people through this experiential exercise and all the dogs go like this. <laughs> We're not touching them. So this is the non-physical thing of the energetic state and emotional state and state of consciousness of the human has a huge effect on the dog. And when dogs walk into my consult room and the people sit down and I'm sitting at the table, you know, asking questions and it's not uncommon for that dog to immediately just relax and do a big burp, which is a sign of really strong parasympathetic activation, hmm. which is rest and digest. You know, you, you don't burp unless you've got good parasympathetic activation going on. So the other thing that the whole energy body balance work is fantastic for is it supports really, really strong somatic or body level relaxation. So it's also really great for dogs with any sort of anxiety, over arousal issues, that sort of thing. So going back, so what I hear you saying there is you yourself get in a very grounded and, and open, I guess what someone might call a calm state, so to speak, which you hope is and expect and have observed is going to translate to the dog. And so that's, uh, you know, you walk in for the first few minutes and maybe that's what someone sees is a whole, a whole lot of really calm, nothing going on. Um, well, that, and a lot of people say to me, wow, you know, I've had multiple people say, wow, you're the first vet who's been able to connect with my dog like that. Now there's a lot going on there, right? So because I started off at a young age of really being very, very passionate about natural horsemanship. And if you want to work with Monty Roberts sort of way of working with horses, you've got to get very, very sensitive to the very subtle body language cues and expression cues and changes in breathing and everything from the animal. So the touch and my state of awareness and everything is part of it. But the other thing is that I'm connecting and listening to the dog and communicating to the dog and responding to their signals the whole way through. So this is another thing that, that, that I teach, right? As best I can is to teach people how to start to talk dog. So that they're communicating and most humans are pretty bad at communicating with their dogs. And most humans have got no boundaries with their dogs and dogs need loving, clear boundaries to be happy and, and calm. So part of the thing that people see when they come to see me is that, wow, how do you do that with my dog? <laughs> and I'm just going, well, you know, I, if it's a really pushy dog, the first thing I do is, whoa, I have personal space. Excuse me. And we'll have a little conversation about that until the dog goes, oh, my God, this human's never, I've never had a human tell me it's had a personal space before. This is kind of strange. <laughs> but once they get that, you see the dog settle into themselves because they know where they fit and they know that there's a connection here that they can trust and that's, that's a big part of what happens. Interesting. Now, um, you know, there's probably so many different um, rabbit holes we could go down with with this type of work. So, you know, we promised yeah. our listeners we would we would focus on on pain since that seems to be um, the issue that um, you know comes up the most. Um, but from what I hear from you is that there's often pain that you don't know that your dog has because they aren't going to speak up and tell you about it, and it takes someone with a trained eye to 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 see and or sense that. So, what what are some of those signs? Okay. The first thing is, the trained eye is pretty much useless. Um, now, I'll just quickly tell a story. About five year, four or five years ago, I was doing a, a live training in behind the Gold Coast near Brisbane in Australia. I had 10 people and about 15 dogs. And Mitzi and Pearl are my demonstration dogs. They come along with me when I do live trainings. And Mitzi that day was like, he's... he's one of his nicknames is Grumble Bum because he tends to growl at anyone who comes into his space. Like he doesn't like people coming into his space for other dogs. But he was out of control that day. He was grumbling and growling. And I thought, wow, that's strange. He's not quite his normal self, right? But otherwise, he was fine. He was jumping on and off the couch. He was eating, he was playing, everything like that. So that night when I got home, I got him a hop on my knee and I went to check check his neck because I thought there's something wrong. And I just gently started to assess him behind his ears at the top of his neck here. And as soon as I touched him, he was like, 
he went all stiff and rigid and mm. looked at me and started whimpering. Mm. So he had a really screamingly painful neck, right? Now, I was married at the time, so I said to my wife, um, hey, wow, Mitch, he's got a really sore neck. That's strange. She said, oh, yeah, he had a terrible fall on the steps about three weeks ago. And I'm thinking, God damn, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> so at that time, I thought that I could look at my dog and tell what was going on. Right. And it was. And, and you're, look. you're obviously a vet at this time. So yeah, you yeah, are the, is. you are the <laughs> trained eye that you're referring yeah, to here. That's exactly right. And I may have been suffering for, from some gratuitous veterinary arrogance, <laughs> which is vets are prone to. Any professional is prone to, I think in a way, yeah. because you, you think you're the expert, right? But this is when I this is when I realised that the only way, the only way I can know with my dogs what's going on with their pain levels is to assess them hands on, and you need to learn how to assess for neurofascial pain and neck and back pain, or take your dogs to someone who's skilled in that sort of assessment. Because I've had multiple multiple dogs come to me who've been assessed by vets who've missed really significant silent pain. Hmm. And this is not saying they're bad vets, it just means they've never been taught how to assess for this sort of pain. Hmm. And they're probably overly dependent on things like x-rays, CTs, MRIs, that don't pick up soft tissue pain. They can't pick up soft tissue problems, those diagnostic tools. So um, there are some signs that I've become more aware of. So with Mitzi, there's a behavioural change. Right? He was more growly and, and guarded of his space than usual. So if you get a dog that has a sudden change in behavior, so they go from being a happy, engaged dog that's happy to hang out and play with others and suddenly stand offish or growling at other dogs and snappy or not wanting to be touched in certain part of their body or just distant and disconnected from the humans, then there's often pain underlying that. Um, another really important thing to do is look at how your dog shakes. So a dog with no pain, they'll shake from the head and the wave will go all the way through the tip of the tail, nice and strong and even. Starting at the head. Yep, it always starts at the head. So if you don't want your dog to shake, hold it, hold it by the nose when you're washing it, it won't be able to shake all over you. But if you've got a dog that's got pain, they might just shake their head and then it peters out or it might shake but be weak, or, but they won't shake a nice strong wave of this shaking movement right through the body. Hmm, interesting. Um, Another really important one is that if your dog, if you allow your dog on the couch in beds or in the car or whatever, which most people do, I certainly do, if your dog suddenly doesn't seem to want to jump on the couch or the bed, I can tell you it's not because they don't want to, it's nearly always because something's happened and they've now got pain that's stopping them. Because getting on the bed or in the couch is a high value thing for a dog. They love it. <laughs> yeah. And, um, Another, you know, another really important one is probably think about play. You know, if you've got a dog that likes, used to like to play and isn't playing anymore, then that's, that's something that you need to look into because healthy, happy dogs that are comfortable in their bodies play. Um, and everything's got to be right for a dog to be playful, right, to play. It's one of those behaviours that everything has to be right, otherwise it won't happen. And one other thing to look for is this thing called a pain grimace. So if you've got a long-term chronic pain, they get tension in the face muscles. Hmm. So you see me go like this? Yeah. So you can see this fixed tension in the face. And, um, you know, there's, 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 sort of, there's three main causes of this silent, invisible pain that I see. Um, so... Well, there's neck pain, there's back pain. They're sort of the same thing, but they're a bit different. Neurofascial pain, though, is the real thing, you know, and most neck and back pain has got a neurofascial component because it's the it's connective tissues, mm -hmm. not only outside the spine, all the tendons and ligaments and layers of fascia in all these complex muscles and facet joints around the spine, but also you've got the, um, inside the spine, you've got the, the, the very, very special, special fascial layer that protects the spine and brain, the, the dura mater, the, the um, um, meninges and all that sort of stuff, which can also get restrictions and pain and tension. And these, then that, that tissue comes out around the nerve roots 
So the fascia that protects the spine and the brain, then each place along the spine where the nerve roots come out, there's a, a, a layer of that fascia comes out with the nerve root. So you've got this connection from within the deepest, most protected, most sensitive parts of the body to where it comes out. And when you work on the fascial tissues on the outside, you can actually release within the spine and brain as well. Hmm. So it's, it's really, really important. And probably the other main cause of silent pain that I see, which is really important in older animals, is arthritis. But I've never seen an arthritic dog that doesn't have significant neurofascial pain to go with it. Hmm. So, and so is you, that a correlation or a causation in your view look i i don't know i think probably i well it might be more accurate to say that i've never seen an older animal that doesn't have neurofascial pain even if they don't really have significant arthritis the wear and tear of life over time traps micro traumas in the neurofascial network again and again and again until you get this sort of build up of pain and tension and trap trauma mm -hmm. in the neurofascial network so but then if you've got a dog with arthritis then they're compensating. They're not moving their body in a healthy way and they're holding tension because of pain. And both of these are things that are going to cause increased neurofascial tension over time. Hmm. So it's probably a, a bit of a kind of a downward cycle in that, you know, the, the, the fascia may become tight or constricted or et cetera, which causes them to favor one side or another, which causes more load on certain joints, which causes more inflammation, which causes them to overcompensate in other areas potentially, and it's more of a cascade effect potentially. Yeah, you know, for me, from my personal experience, if I don't move and stretch every day, if I don't care for my body and maintain my body, if I don't have regular body work to get my own fascia, to keep it supple and open and healthy, I don't do well. And the same thing is true for animals, and that's why... You know, one of my big motivations in getting this online course happening is that I want to be able to give people the opportunity to, to get their hands on their dogs every day and make their life a better place. And the opportunity to be able to learn how to assess their dogs so that if they can get their hands on their dog at least once a week and do an assessment protocol to find out what's going on. And if there is something that comes up, you know, then you can do hands-on work to help them. If the hands-on work isn't, doing enough then you go to the vet and see is there something more serious going on you know so it's it's really really important and more than half the dogs i see have significant silent pain that their owners are have no idea is there wow wow and so uh well, let's talk about your your course again for a bit here so that's at again at webb the number four pets.com web for pets.com so what would someone who signs up for on the course um, expect to find there and what would you like for them to, to get out of it? So what it is, is um, like the live, the live training is two days of me taking people through a whole series of um, hands-on stuff, uh, experiential exercises, practicing, learning the actual hands-on skills of assessment and a whole lot of releases and we learn craniosacral techniques and a whole lot of different things. And that's all online. So there's about eight or nine videos for each day. As soon as you enroll, you can get started. It's all sort of on demand. There's, there's three different packages. So there's a core package, which is for people who just want to work on their own animals and maybe give away free sessions to other people. And there's expert and professional packages, which if you want to qualify as a practitioner and maybe start or add to a business that you work with animals, then you can do that. Um, the learning content is the same in all three. It's just that the other two have the qualification process and one-on-one and -on -one time with me hmm. where we work, you know, like this. Very cool. And what's the, um, what's, what's the price or, or timing or anything else that um, someone would expect? Like how long does it take to go through everything? Look, it varies a bit about how much time people have, but you should be able to get through it in a couple of months. Some people will be quicker, some people will be slower. Um, some people take ages because they've got busy lives and or something happens and they need to put it down for a little while and pick it up again later, but it, it's, it's lifetime access, so you just get through it as you can. Got it. Um, 
So we talked about some of the, the hit. So I have a brand of, of supplements that are specially designed for golden retrievers um, called, called Sunnies, um, which is named in honor of, of my golden who I grew up with. And um, you know, goldens are known for having joint problems, hip dysplasia, et cetera. And a lot of folks um, listening to this podcast are um, come to us from Sunnies. And so our golden retriever owners, um, or they just have, you know, big dogs that have some of these joint problems, et cetera. So what, what are some of the common issues? Maybe they're more common for goldens and or other large breed dogs that, that you see. In terms of joint, joint conditions, joint conditions or hidden pain or anything that you seem to have seen you know, more frequently than, than in other breeds? Look, um, when it comes to this sort of chronic pain issues, I don't necessarily focus too much on diagnosing exactly what's causing it, you know, and when I'm teaching people, I'm just teaching them to assess for pain, tension, or lack of healthy movement in the body. Um, now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that if you're not a veterinarian, you're not allowed to diagnose anything. Yeah, so it's it, they get upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But, you know, I think that you're going to find silent pain is going to be there with a lot of other conditions. And I think, too, you know, Life, you can't live life without having some pain in your body, right? Life is a high impact activity one way or another. It doesn't matter what you do. You have this thing like, you know, my back's sore today. It's not as sore as it was yesterday, but yesterday I had to do a whole lot of work on myself just to get things moving because I stretched the night before last and something went ping. And it's like, oh, God, damn it. That's no fun. <laughs> I'm used to this. It happens, right? It happens to our dogs too, but they can't say anything about it. So I, I try not, and in terms of problems, you know, if you've got developmental joint disease, like a lot of larger breeds and pure breeds have joint dysplasias. So, you know, you get puppies that are lame. Well, Six-month-old dogs, suddenly they start limping on a front leg. Hmm. You know, any of these large breed dogs that have got that sort of stuff going on, you need to go and get x-rays and look at the actual joints, maybe CTs, because CTs are actually probably better for picking up a lot of that stuff than X-rays. So the other thing is that you've got to integrate my approach with the best of the veterinary world too, right? And many of these dogs are going to do better with surgery than without it. So you've got to look into if you've got a, a Golden or a, a, some sort of Mastiff or a Dane, it's quite a lot of these dogs have joint dysplasia problems. They have elbow, elbow dysplasia, stifle dysplasia, um, shoulder dysplasia, and you're going to need to go in there and rem remove the loose cartilage and clean up the joint and do the right surgery. If you've got really bad hip dysplasia, you might need to do particular massive surgeries, which I don't like, but some dogs do better on them than without them, right? Or if you've got a dog that suddenly gets a sudden... Hind limb lameness, you know, one of the very common hind limb lamenesses is a ruptured cruciate. Then you may need to do surgery and then address all the soft tissue issues as well. So this work is also going to help your dog move through recovery and rehab from any sort of accident or trauma because you're going to keep the body moving. You're going to keep inviting healthy movement. You're going to be able to search out and seek out these areas in the body that are locking up and getting tight and painful and gently dissolve them before they get too embedded and cause too much trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's something to use as an integrated approach with the best of conventional medicine when needed and, of course, holistic medicine preferably in, is my sort of worldview. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a balance of, of both and each, each has their place is what I hear you, you saying. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think it's, I get clients who get so fundamentalist about, I will not do anything but holistic treatments. Right. And sometimes I have to stand them up and say, look, I, just listen to me for a second. <laughs> you might be causing your dog more pain than you need to, or you just 
let's have a look at what's going to be best for your dog and not get too dogmatic about anything. Now, I always try to use conventional medicines as a last resort, but I don't want to shut the door on them if it's going to mean a better quality of life for the, for the animal. You know what I mean? So, and I see a lot of people get super fundamentalist on either side of the fence, and I don't think it serves anyone. Yeah. Got it. Um, from a personal perspective, you, you said, so uh, in terms of your own body work, you get rolfing once a month. What else to stay nice and loose and flexy? Okay. So I, I have a pretty intense personal practice. I get up in the morning and I do Qigong. I have a Qigong practice. Um, I do some sort of, so I do, I do some intense push ups as many as I can in a minute, five mornings a week. Um, and Qigong, I'll do an hour or two probably each morning. Well, wow. I'll do some resistance work. So I've got some kettlebells over there on the floor next to the fireplace. Um, so I want to lift enough weights to get a bit sore muscles the next day, probably at least twice a week. Um, I, other body work that I find really good is Kahuna, Lomi Lomi. They're both really, really good. Um, body works that have an energetic basis as well as physical. I find I get fantastic relief from them. Um, there's another thing that I've found that's really helped me is a thing called Butiko breathing, which is from a, a Russian guy, which is a special form of breathing practice where you actually breathe less. Hmm. And the thing behind that is that if you hyperventilate, you wash all the carbon dioxide out of your system out of your blood and then that means that the the oxygen cannot get into your tissues the, the blood when there's low carbon dioxide hangs onto the oxygen hmm. so you need to so I, I do some practice of that every morning too and i do meditation and 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 sort of self body work and energy stuff as well at most days so i have, have a pretty intense practice but you know i've had pretty intense health issues and i found that i need to do that to stay functional very interesting stuff. I'll have to email you separately to get the, the names of all of those because there's some things that I hadn't, have not heard of. Um, cool. All right, doctor. Well, I think we've gone through some great stuff here. Uh, you know, I, I counted five signs that you went through in terms of uh, finding hidden pain in your dog. So we'll uh, okay. see about editing, uh, adjusting that headline here on the episode. But um, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we sign off? Look, I, I don't think so, but I, maybe maybe one thing is that the greatest way you can help your dogs as a human being is to work on yourself, is to find someone who can help you move through and process and heal your own trauma because if you're sitting on unresolved trauma and if, even if you think you don't know about it, nearly all of us are, you know, find someone who does some sort of, you know, doing the role thing and all the body work will help start to loosen that up. Meditation. Um, if you've got anxiety, go get some help. Find a professional to help you resolve and deal with and lessen your anxiety because if you live in chronic anxiety, it has a chronic adverse impact on your animals. And particularly trauma, you know, um, if, if you can find someone that has a really good somatic approach to working with and healing trauma somatic experiencing is is one particular modality of therapy that is really good for that sort of thing um it'll change your animals lives but i gotta tell you it's not easy <laughs> right? so you're gonna have to have some courage and determination because one thing i've learned you know in the last two years um my wife dumped me and it was incredibly emotionally difficult for me and mm. it triggered a, all the trauma in my life came up in my face. And the one thing I've discovered is that the fear of feeling the feelings is always worse than feeling the feelings. Hmm. You know, we torture ourselves about how, how awful it'll be to feel anything. And then when you go and feel it, it's like, God damn, I was actually doing myself more harm and it was more uncomfortable to be worried about feeling what I'm feeling. You know what I mean? And the other thing I found is that the more that I can, feel the uncomfortable feelings, the more joy and wonder and beauty there is in my life. So, yeah. Wow. Well, you saved the most profound part for the end. So I think, uh, <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a, 
an episode sequel here and I might need to up, update the, the name of this episode to heal yourself before healing your dog. <laughs> well, absolutely. I'd be happy to come back anytime and, and talk more. I can, we could probably do a dozen of these things, I reckon. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I greatly enjoyed this and uh, thanks so much for sharing, Doctor. Uh, again, Dr. Edward Bassingwaith. You can find him at healing, thehealingvet.com and his online course of the whole energy body balance method is at webb, the number four, pets.com, web for pets. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Mm, go ahead. Look me up on Facebook too. And I, I, like I said, there's a, I have a free webinar every two weeks. But- going digging right into pain in dogs and how why it's important how it works and going into much more detail than we had time for today so if you're interested in that hit me up and i'll send you a link great and on facebook you're at the healing vet the healing vet and for your webinar they can sign up for that on facebook group or your website where at oh um facebook or or message me okay got it all right doctor Thanks so much. It's been great. And uh, have a great, a great day there down under since it's morning for you. I will do. Thank you.